Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sue Thomas, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, thank you. <laughs> Don't usually get applause. And those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on Portland Com Community Media's City Net 30. Thank you for joining City Club on Friday, February 5th for this week's Friday Forum. Today we will hear from Mayor Sam Adams about the state of the city. But first, some announcements. This is the time when I remind everyone about your cell phones. Despite this warning, there's always one that goes off during the broadcast, so now is the time to turn them off. As always, we offer our appreciation to our Friday Forum sponsors, without whose generous support these time-honored City Club luncheons would not be possible. Please join me in offering our appreciation to our winter quarter sponsors, Stoll Reeves, The Standard, and West Coast Bank. Thank you very much. City Club offers unique opportunities to make a difference in the issues that are most important to our community and our region. If you're not currently a member of City Club but would like to learn more about joining the club uh, and becoming active in Portland civic life, we invite you to join us on February 26th at Cork Wine Shop in Northwest Portland for the kickoff of our spring membership drive. You can learn more about this on our website at pdxcityclub.org. At next week's Friday Forum, Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler will offer his State of the County Address. Reservations are going fast, so please book your tickets now to ensure yourself a place at the table. And now to today's program. I know we're all anxious to hear from today's speaker, so I will keep my introduction brief. Um, I also want to say that we are very committed to having enough time for questions, and I've given fair warning to the mayor that um, I will give him a friendly reminder when question time is about to begin. So rest assured, you'll have your, you'll have your opportunity. Sam Adams first gravitated to politics as a student at the University of Oregon when he was intern with uh, Congressman Peter DeFazio. Adams then worked for the Oregon House Democratic Committee and for the Democratic majority Carl Hustica before successfully managing Beer Katz's first campaign for mayor in 1991. At age 29, he began the first of 11 years as the youngest mayoral chief of staff in the city's history. Adams won a seat on the Portland City Council in 2004, where he was commissioner in charge of Portland's Office of Transportation and the Bureau of Environmental Services. He was elected mayor in May 2008. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mayor Sam Adams. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sam Adams, City Club member. Um, the, the membership committee. A uh, few people I want to recognize uh, at the outset. First, um, I'm very blessed to have a wonderful family uh, who show me a lot of love and put up with um, significant absences uh, from me. Uh, my boyfriend, Peter Zuckerman, my mom, Kara, my grandma, Marie, and my stepfather, Stuart. Give him a round of applause. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> I also want to uh, single out, uh, on behalf of the entire city, uh, a passionate, smart group of folks who agree, disagree, but always have in their heart the best interests of this city. My colleagues on the Portland City Council, Nick Fish, Randy Leonard, Amanda Fritz, Stan Saltzman, thank you. Honored guests, members of the City Council, our listeners on Oregon Public Broadcasting, uh, viewers on uh, community media access, I am pleased to be here today. As mayor, I interact every day with Portlanders of every perspective. It's one of the great jobs of being mayor. I truly relish the chance to mix with people 
of all parts of the city from all points of view. It is a rich, a city rich in diverse outlooks. But this year, of all my many years of public service, have been unique for its singularity. For the first time, almost everyone shares the primary concerns about jobs. It's about your job. If you have one, you've been telling me you're concerned about how long your employer will keep you. If you've been laid off or reduced to part-time, you're concerned about getting back to full strength. And if you're already employed, or unemployed, I should say, you're anxious about finding the next opportunity. These are real-life realities I hear every day as your mayor. Like Jean, a mother with a long face and two infants and matching red sweaters who sat next to me on the light rail max one evening. She told me how she had to walk away from her home and into foreclosure because she couldn't make the mortgage payments after being furloughed. Or Mike, a, a short guy with a, a stout guy wearing a baseball cap who knocked on my front door in Kenton one Sunday afternoon selling uh, tamales from a portable cooler to make ends meet. We are being battered by a hundred-year economic storm. Not since the Great Depression have Gene, Mike, their families and neighbors seen it so tough. You might not know Gene, you might not know Mike, but you know people like them. They're your brother, your sister, your friend, your neighbor. Today, I will articulate what the city of Portland has done and will do to ensure that the good times of yesterday are dwarfed by the opportunities of tomorrow, that the genes and the mics we all know will never again face this level of joblessness. And knowing all that Portlanders are capable all that Portlanders are capable of. As a report on the state of our city, I am confident of this. We will recover. And more than just recover, we will come out of this recession more resilient. For Portland, being resilient is about being more self-sufficient, smarter and creative, less wasteful, even more beautiful in our design, more equitable, and at the same time, stronger and more nimble. We are proud to be Portlanders, and appropriately so. We make a lot of top 10 lists. That should encourage us to do more. And it also means that we must acknowledge, at the same time, that we have serious civic issues to address. This 100-year economic storm scraped off a veneer of prosperity and revealed vulnerabilities in our economy, schools, and sustainability. Your City Council has worked hard to immediately help those in greater need. Four percent across the board budget cuts were required to balance the city budget, but at the same time, increases of over 30 percent to the programs that help those most in need, like housing and homelessness and help for small businesses. And at the same time, this year, last year, we completed the largest reform of the bureaucracy that has happened in a generation. But we on the City Council understand there is so much more work to do. Moving ahead, we will invest more in the success of our Portland-based businesses. And we will focus even more on where we can earn a competitive advantage in an economy that has gone global. We are an emerging leader in sustainable industries and clean technology practices in all industries. There isn't any reason why Portland can't become the nation's new hub for clean technology. It means to create electricity and fuels with a smaller environmental footprint, and we should be exporting all these goods and services around the globe. Of course, I, I meet with mayors from time to time around the country, and I can tell you with great confidence that 
Houston, Chicago, San Jose, and others are also vying to be the hub uh, of clean technology in this nation. And that's why this recession compels us to work from an economic strategy and give it everything we've got. Gene and Mike don't have to work in the clean tech, tech sector to enjoy its benefits. Jean might not choose to work in the clean tech sector, but her children might. But today's Portland's education system might not prepare her kids for tomorrow's jobs. And work is underway to address this, but still, 63%, only 63% of our eighth graders graduate from high school on time. Now, personally, I find this unconscionable. But even if you don't see it like I do, the fact is, Gene's children are the workforce of tomorrow. Educational performance is not an ideological issue. It is not a partisan issue. It is the cornerstone. It is the cornerstone of the foundation of our healthy local economy. And we will do whatever it takes, working across jurisdictional lines, to cut the dropout rate in half so that 80% of our students graduate on time and more go on to college and skill training. Our economy, our schools, and now let's talk about the third revelation of this brutal economic storm. The fact is, and it's a surprise when I talk to Portlanders about this particular vulnerability. It's a surprise to a lot of Portlanders that we remain overly reliant on yesterday's energy production models. Most people think we get our energy somehow from the Bonneville Dam system. We don't. Unsustainable fossil fuels still power too much of our quality of life. In Portland, that means coal. 43% of all the energy we consume in the city of Portland is, comes from the bowels of Wyoming, railroaded to Boardman and beyond and burned into the blue skies of Eastern Oregon and the Rocky Mountains. Folks, we do so much green good here at home, from bicycling to recycling and more, but we need to kick our coal habit. Portland General Electric, Portland's principal energy provider and the owner of the Boardman plant is headed in the right direction we have uh, a number of people from PG here, including Carol. Uh, please join us, uh, please join me in thanking you for moving to phase out Boardman. But remember, it's about a lot more than just doing the right thing. The so-called right thing to do tends to resonate with those who have the luxury to afford the alternatives that up till now have tended to be more expensive. Mike, who's concerned about his Nick's tamale sale, can't necessarily automatically sign up for green power. Mike is looking for a living wage job. So here's the best part about our approach. Because we have a growing wind and solar industry right here, kicking the coal habit, our coal habit, means growing jobs right here at home. And there is no way that we are going to let this opportunity pass us by. These three pieces of Portland, our economy, our schools, our sustainability, need more focus, are getting more focus from the city council. But let's be clear, these are deep structural issues. Easy wave the wand, easy fixes don't exist. Fixing them will be hard. But that economic storm that, faced, that we face compels us to recalibrate in recovery in service to a more resilient Portland. And my job is to look the Gene and Mike straight in the eye and say, I've got your back. I understand your fear and how you feel the issues that you face and the source of the problem. And as your mayor with your city council, we're on it. Now, you know it's not a Sam Adams speech unless we do at least a few details, but I will try and make the specifics at least uh, mildly entertaining. So let me tell you, give you an example of how this pulls, how we've sort of pulled it all together. Last month, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, State Representative Jules Bailey, 
uh, other great legislators, and I stood at the home in Northeast Portland to launch Senator Markley's federal legislation that would broadcast nationally an idea born and raised right here, Clean Energy Works Portland. Clean Energy Works Portland creates a first-in-the-nation program to enable on-bill financing. I know on-bill financing isn't exactly a t-shirt-worthy slogan, but check out this video that Green For All, our national nonprofit partner in this effort, put together about Clean Energy Works Portland. A lot of people that I know that were in the construction business were losing their jobs. But in the midst of this, we were actually creating and getting bigger with the home performance portion of our business. We feel very blessed that way that uh, when everybody was laying off people, we were like, okay, let's prepare ourselves for the future and start hiring people. There's nothing more exciting to talk about than actually seeing families moved out of poverty especially in an economy like we find ourselves in. One of the areas with the most proudest and hope in this moment is in a project in Portland that Green For All is excited to be a part of. So there's an aspect of Clean Energy Works that's just sort of a geeky and wonky financial one, but really addresses what has been holding back much of our potential, much of our efforts to really make this country more sustainable, and that's around financing. This is the nation's first on-bill financing and payoff in the United States. We finally will have a way to not only get the energy audits done in our homes and offices and industrial facilities, but we'll actually have a way to implement those audits and pay for them over time. I'm Bernice Lopez Dorsey and I am a weatherization contractor. My um, husband was in the painting industry, the general contracting business, and 11 years ago he became disabled, so I took over the business. Uh, this is a great opportunity for Portland uh, and everybody, all the small businesses like me, to create green jobs and continue to do a good job and feel good about it and make our city more sustainable. I think it's the most inclusionary program that I've seen the cities uh, put out in the 10 years that I've been doing contracting. So we're excited to see that the city's moving in a direction to be more inclusionary for both the neighborhood and the minority community. The company I used to work for, we used to be like 125 people in the company and now there are only like 10 people in there. So it's not much future in there. So that's why I try to stay with that. These new companies, they, they're growing. They're, this program is really a chance for people to change their lives altogether. Before I came to PYV, I was 19 years old and got married and had a kid, two years old now, and without PYV, I have no idea where I would be. This has happened in the city of Portland because of a partnership with the city and the mayor, members of the city council, the labor movement, civil rights organizations, faith organizations, and really a community that's come together to create a community workforce agreement that says these are the standards. This is a scalable effort, you know, that can scale up to work, you know, in the largest cities statewide through all states in the United States. I just hope that the support is there because we really need it. You know, as a small um, business owner, it's, it's, we make the difference one house at a time. And I am pleased to introduce the star of this video, Bernice Lopez Dorsey. Bernice, stand up. <laughs> now I've seen firsthand Bernice's work and it's fantastic. So if you want um, a great contractor, you can, uh, she's at helppdx.com, helppdx.com, and we're having a sale? We're having a sale? <laughs> no, maybe not.
I also want to, uh, this, is, uh, this has become a regional effort and there's some folks who have contributed in all kinds of ways over the years to help get this going. I'd like you to rec help me in uh, saying hello and recognizing Gresham Mayor Shane Bemis, Multnomah County Commissioner Diane McKeel, Metro Councilor Rex Burkhalter. Thank you for your work. And a great leader who was cool on sustainability before I think the, the word even was in common usage, uh, our great former governor, Barbara Roberts. Thanks for being here. So it's obvious how Clean Energy Works Portland helps Bernice, but what about Gene and Mike's of Portland and, and of Oregon? Well, they benefit in a whole web of ways. To the construction industry, where three out of one out of three Portlanders are currently out of work, it means a growing retrofit and remodeling industry for our skilled workers. For our children, it means a house that is warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, and greener year-round. For the homeowner, it means more energy saved with the potential for more cash in hand. And for Portland's economy, it means we continue to lead the nation in sustainability while we build the smart energy industry of tomorrow. Jobs, education, sustainability, what used to be separate actions are now partnered together in a single effort for a more prosperous and resilient city. But clean energy works isn't alone as our only effort. There's much more. In 2009, we recruited clean tech companies like Swiss rechargeable battery maker Revolt, and we got the federal government to spend $75 million to help us build the Eastside Streetcar Loop. The Loop will, for the first time, bring modern streetcars to the east side of the river, and we anticipate 1,300 living wage jobs created. We know that we just have to consider this as just getting started. Portland was once a streetcar city, and it shall return to being a streetcar city. And by city, I mean city ride, citywide. Does anyone know where this is in the city of Portland? So that's right, Southeast 92nd and Foster Boulevard. It's the heart of Lentz. Now, watch what one person's vision of this intersection is. <laughs> Who knew four-story buildings could bounce? Now, if you look closely, that's a supermarket on the right, that's a coffee shop on the left, and the new, new copper penny right in the middle. The point of this slide is that streetcars no longer will be exclusively a downtown or central city amenity. We're taking them out to the neighborhoods. And best of all, the streetcars we build right here by Oregon Ironworks are on sale to the rest of the country. The only streetcar that meets the Buy America requirements for federal dollars. And my thanks to the federal delegation that helped make this happen. Some of the representatives are in the office. Uh, are in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Clean Energy Works, Revolt, the Oregon Ironworks are examples of our economic development strategy in action. And last year, the City Council and the Portland Development Commission agreed on a five-year action plan to create 10,000 new jobs. Maybe you heard about it, maybe you didn't, but it's the boldest, most focused, most strategic economic development plan Portland has ever seen. And not insignificantly, it was developed in conjunction with the City-County Climate Action Plan. Economic prosperity and environmental progress have never been more in sync. And my thanks to the Portland Development Commission and Multnomah County for your great work. Thank you. All of these efforts will tie together in the Portland Plan. Launched last fall, the Portland Plan, when completed, will bring the Economic Development Plan, the Climate Action Plan, and all of our neighborhood plans into one home, articulating who we want to be over the next 25 years. State law 
might require us to do this plan, but they don't require us to do it right. And Portland plans better than almost any other city in the country. But let me state the obvious. Plans without action are irrelevant. So our work must continue. Now, I've never met a business owner that wanted to lay off her employees. It's a heart-wrenching decision with repercussions that are painful beyond the bottom line. Business owners want to hire back their people, but in today's fiscal environment, they can't get access to enough affordable capital to regain their footing. Access to working capital is a problem of international magnitude, obviously. And I sure hope that all those smart and important people come back from uh, Davos, Switzerland, and act immediately on a great set of ideas to get things going. Here at home, city government obviously cannot totally solve the global financial problems, but we can help. We can help make working capital available to our local businesses. So today, through smart use of our federal stimulus resources, we're announcing the formation of the Sustainable Development Fund. The Sustainable Development Fund will be a best-in-the-nation green financing fund of up to $33 million in resources, which will help finance the growth of our clean tech traded sector. And in conjunction with the Sustainable Development Fund, given that we have thousands and thousands of new business license issued in the last couple, in the last 10, 24 months, because mostly from people that are out of work, we're also launching the creation of the Portland Small Business Seed Fund. In today's frozen fiscal environment, the seeds of inspiration cannot germinate enough private capital if enough private capital hasn't thawed. And it is particularly painful in the category of investment of relatively modest investment of ten to twenty thousand dollars, and that's why the city of Portland has put up the first half a million dollars. And I challenge all those banks and all those financial institutions with their feel-good, we have money to lend to small businesses ads to match Portland's upfront half a million dollar investment and invest in the Portland Small Business Seed Fund. You know, I had a chance to go back to the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I saw firsthand how the uh, nation is being polarized in a way I've, I've never seen before. And for citizens, objective information can be extremely hard to come by, as the 24-hour news cycle prioritizes speed over substance. President Obama has a, has a tough job. He's tackling big issues and getting stuck in a lot of partisan congressional gridlock. On a rainy afternoon last week, I experienced a different kind of gridlock on the central east side. I got snarled in the streetcar construction on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. How many of you have been through that? Okay. All right. I'll need security to get out of here. Looking around, uh, stuck, looking around, I was amazed at how Portlanders were remarkably calm in the light of the situation. Annoyed, of course, but most Portlanders understand the near-term construction jobs that we so desperately need, the chance for this important east side commercial corridor to finally bloom. And I want them to also understand that our niche, not to be the biggest city, but our niche is a place of relentless urban innovation. And as we navigated the MLK bottleneck, my thoughts turned across the river to our next urban innovation, the Oregon Sustainability Center. The Oregon Sustainability Center will be the largest ecologically living building on Earth. I keep saying that and asking people to correct me if they can point to something else. So far, so good. The governor and I, along with higher education, a scrappy group of nonprofits, the Portland Development Commission, and our ever resourceful federal de delegation, are pushing to build the center on campus of Portland State University, the best urban university in the United States. Say hello to President Vimby Val. And why the building itself will be a beacon for PSUs and our sustainable prowess, along with OHSU, OSU, OIT, did I forget a university? <laughs> U of O. <laughs> wow, I 
guess I'm off the alumni list. All of the universities, it'll be more than a beacon to our sustainable industry prowess with higher education as a key partner. It will be a place that new green building innovations and designs and services get to market. So from the downtown tower to the neighborhood home, we're innovating. Maybe you heard the recent news about curbside composting coming soon to Portland neighborhoods. I have, I like that. Apparently the mayor doesn't get as nice a composting thing as that. Uh, okay, I have to admit that when uh, this issue was first raised, when I took over as a commissioner in charge of the, uh, what was then the Office of Sustainable Development, I didn't realize that 30% of our waste stream comes from food or compostable materials. And getting those materials out of the waste stream, a liability, and into a compost stream, an asset, makes all the sense of the world. We're gonna pilot curbside composting in four neighborhoods this year and expand it in 2011. Gardeners, rejoice. <laughs> Let's pass this around. The same goes that, that spirit of innovation, that spirit of being a living laboratory, also goes for our brand uh, on our new bicycling plan, which elevates our aspirations to one in four trips in Portland to be made by bicycles. It is the most ambitious, the most comprehensive plan of its kind in the country. And by the time we build it out, we will be on par with the great bike cities of Northern Europe. Now, I know there's been some chatter about the cost, and that's appropriate and that's fine, but folks, here's the bottom line. We can't afford not to do it. Think about the cost of any given trip made on bicycle versus the automobile. There is no such thing as a pothole caused by a bike. There is no noise, no emissions, and we're getting exercise, which frankly, some of us, like yours truly, could use more of. And even if you never set foot on a bicycle, and even if you never plan to set foot on a bicycle, you benefit from completing this plan. Fewer vehicles, less congestion, reduced pollution. We're Portland, we lead the nation in bicycling because that's how we roll. But if I'm talking about, and really, I appreciate the extra clips, but if we're talking about innovation and greater resilience through transportation, we have another one of those long-standing underlying problems in our city. I gotta talk about sidewalks, basic sidewalks. You may remember that the state legislature passed a modest increase in the gas tax last year. And in my proposed budget that the City Council will have an opportunity to consider, I'm going to propose that we put $16 million of that new money into a sidewalk development fund for East Portland, North Northeast Portland, and Southwest Portland. <laughs> These are areas of, the of Portland that have never had sidewalks, sadly. As of uh, just a couple weeks ago, I have to add a caveat. Some anti-tax types from somewhere else have submitted an initiative to the state to repeal this source of funding. When you see one of those signature gatherers in the streets, I want you to think about Jean and her two infants. Jean can't afford a car. She relies on transit. Can we really expect her to safely get to her max stop with a stroller in tow without a sidewalk? Is that fair? No, I say no. And when we talk about, that's right. And when we talk about Portland, our values, our destiny, we are talking about everybody. We need to be talking about everybody. Access to a quality education that can prepare today's children for tomorrow's growth sector jobs. 
and the day-to-day -day realities of getting to and from school or to and from that job safely and easily. When we talk about everybody, we're talking about equality. Since the 1950s, Portland has made incredible strides in liberating ourselves from the bur evil burden of hate. But equal opportunity in Portland still is not our reality. This 100-year economic storm battering us is a relatively recent phenomena for many of us. But tragically, our communities have color, of color have faced the vicious winds of poverty and unemployment and the disparity of opportunity for decades. Just take a look at, these, uh, at this graph. The so watch, this is just a snapshot. This is just a snapshot since 2001. And you'll see that the circles in the upper portion of the graph are Caucasian Portlanders, Asian American Portlanders. And you'll see that the circles on the lower left part of the graph indicate the household income and the percent with bachelor's degrees for Native Americans and African Americans. You will see that just since the year 2000, Asian American Portlanders and Caucasian Portlanders have done better. And meanwhile, we have significant, uh, significant lack of opportunity for Latino, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Black Americans. This is an issue if we are to be a truly resilient city we must face. Our success as a city should be measured by the success that have the least. Equality of opportunity doesn't happen overnight, and I certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. But I do know it begins with partnership. And to this end, the City Council is building on the work done over the past decade by organizations like the Urban League, the African American uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Albina Community Alliance, the Southeast Asian House Center, ERCO, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, NEA, to address these disparities. And it is a council-wide team effort. I've been pushing forward, as you saw in the video, the Community Benefit Agreement to ensure our clean tech strategies benefit all Portlanders. Commissioner Nick Fish is taking the lead on the disparity study that is what is legally required to help Portland address inequities in business development and purchasing. Randy Leonard this year took the lead on making sure that communities of color have representation on procurement selection committees. Commissioner Amanda Fritz is getting the city's Human Relations Commission off the ground, and Commissioner Dan Saltzman with Police Chief Rosie Sizer are taking the hard look necessary to meaningfully address racial profiling. Let Portland be the home of the most equal opportunities. But above all, equality begins at home and in the classroom. There is no substitute for a good education. That's not just a rallying cry, that's a fact. For Portland to be truly resilient, every student, regardless of income, background, or neighborhood, must have access to a good education. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a ways to go to help our schools. Along with Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler, we've gone right to the source of the problem. Last summer, more than 1,300 students identified at most at risk of dropping out were enrolled in the Summer Youth Connect program. The vast majority of those students were youth of color. They took summer courses. To catch up in school, they worked and earned money, summer jobs, toured work sites, apprenticeship programs, and went to college campuses. You probably get the point of this effort. It's actually based on a lot of scientific work. It's about giving our students a window, a window seat to look out onto the range of opportunities they can enjoy if they perform and earn their diplomas. And if anyone is here, I know Superintendent uh, Carol Smith is here. I know Rebecca Levinson is here from the Teachers Union. If you're involved in education, please stand up. Diane, uh, Dan Ryan's here. Please stand up. You have the hardest job. When I talk about 
where we need to improve in education, I underline the word we. For too long, it has been viewed as solely a school problem, and, and Chair Wheeler and I are trying to change that. And as part of this effort, we're a proud investor. The city is a proud investor in the Right Brain Initiative, which engages, engages almost 11,000 students in the region in the creative processes of music, dance, art, and theater, and connecting this content to the core subjects of math and science. These efforts are about helping students see a bigger picture. I've told my own story along these lines countless times, thanks to a, how should I put it politely, an encouraging mother when it comes to education, and a cajoling uh, teacher or two along the way. If it wasn't for their, their constant focus on my education, I know I wouldn't have made it. And our efforts locally is called Summer Youth Connect is about connecting the dots between education and workplace success. And the innovation across jurisdictions and service to our youth includes Youth Pass, a program that made students give students free passes free of charge on TriMet. I want to thank the youth commissioners for helping to make this, this happen. But today, I'm pleased to announce another incentive to get our youth on track in high school and on to the next opportunity. That opportunity, if the students choose to engage it, is free tuition at Mount Hood and Portland Community Colleges, the campuses of their choice. That's right. At full strength, the city council and our community colleges will partner to offer up to $2 million annually in scholarships to cover the cost for tuition to as many Summer Youth Connect students as possible. <laughs> Getting an associate's degree in skill training just got a lot more easy. I want to uh, recognize Preston Pulliam and Dr. Ski, presidents of these two colleges, for their great work. Stand up. It's my clothes, I promise. I'm getting the hook, so I'll wrap up. Even in the midst of this brutal 100-year storm, I want Portlanders to look back in 2030 and to say with admad with admit admiration, to say with admiration, admiration, <laughs> hopefully they'll be better speakers, to say with admiration that during this time, our time, that we not only took care of the immediate needs of the genes and the mics, but we tackled the tough, toughest city, civic issues, that in these times we showed an unparalleled level of focus and commitment that Portland became a much more self-sufficient, smarter and created more sustainable, more equitable, stronger and more nimble city. That Portland in the intervening years never again faced today's levels of economic pain. That Portland more than just recovered, we moved far ahead, becoming a truly sustainable city. It is my deep honor to continue to serve as your mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The first question, as always, will be from our City Club host. Our host today is City Club Governor John Horvick. John is the Project Director of Parents and Children Together, the study at OHSU, and is a research associate at the public opinion firm of Davids, Hibbets, and Mitchell. He has joined City Club in 2004, has chaired the club's new Leaders' Council, is currently the Vice Chair of the Research Board, and sits on the Board of Governors. John? Thank you, Mayor. I want to expand the conversation and bring up a forthcoming challenge uh, to the city and other local governments. What steps must Portland take to address the substantial increase in employer contributions to PERS that all agree will occur in the next five years? While the long-term increases are not certain because of potential legislative action, in the short to medium term, there is no solution. The PERS board has already announced increases for employers of three to six percent. Even a three percent increase of Portland's contribution will be substantial in an economy producing reduced tax revenues. 
difficult issue. I think that a answer that we are working on at the city, but government, I think we have a long ways to go, and I think government in general can invest more money in up front and in the intermediate and longer term see the kinds of savings without having to reduce benefits as a focus on wellness. And the cost, the associated costs with the PERS system of uh, the fact that we don't invest enough in wellness of public employees, um, I think there are some opportunities there. Uh, Amanda Fritz is leading that effort, doing a great job as a registered nurse, perfect to lead the effort on the city level. So I think it's investing in employees and their wellness and reducing the costs of providing health care that then can be used to channel in to fortify the uh, funding for PERS. We'll now take questions from the floor. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership. Just a reminder, when you ask your question, please do so in 30 seconds or less, and remember to put a question mark on the end of it. Thank you. Absolutely. Mary Vaughn, City Club member. Uh, I'm interested in uh, sustainability as well. And I'm curious, uh, we heard from an economist, two economists that said uh, two, three weeks ago that uh, every municipality in the country is going after green industry and green business. Explain to me how sustainable it is to tear down a perfectly good park that we still owe money on, a million dollars a year, a little over a million dollars a year uh, for the next 17 years. How is that sustainable to our city as well as how, how is it sustainable to the families that enjoy baseball? Mm. Well, we're not tearing down PG Park. We're actually in the best uh, sense of sustainability. We're actually recycling and, and reusing it. Um, this particular uh, proposal actually is funded by spectators to event facilities in the city. It is, protects the general fund. Uh, it does not take away from any other program of the city. And it has more private investment um, especially, look across the country at, at some of these deals, it has more private investment uh, on behalf of the uh, Paragon Group than most other deals. So this helps, you know, it helps with human health, it helps with keeping Portland a family-friendly city, it, it helps keep us a, a, an interesting and vital place, it reuses a old facility, and uh, we'll continue to work on baseball. But we have this opportunity with soccer and I'm not going to waste it. Matteo Lucio, City Club member and member of the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, thank you very much for your strong support for biking in Portland. Uh, one, uh, well, uh, the $60 million or so that we've spent so far for about 300 miles of biking you know, in, in Portland is equal to about uh, the cost of one mile of uh, urban freeway. I know we get a lot of federal and state uh, funding for a number of, of projects. Uh, what uh, sources of federal and, and state funding do you think uh, you, we can tap into for the bicycle master plan? And, and if not, what other uh, ways do you think we can uh, come up with to fund that? Well, we're very lucky that we've got such a strong bicycling congressman in Earl Blumenauer. And my former boss uh, is chair of the Surface Transportation Subcommittee in the House of Representatives, Peter DeFazio. I think there are a lot of opportunities in the future for more federal funding. Um, we're going to put together a task force and, and look under every rock for every opportunity. And you're right. You know, the cost of one mile of freeway, you know, compared to what in the, you know, in the worst or most expensive case scenario, cost of one mile of freeway just pales in comparison to the costs and benefits, the value proposition of getting more people to bike, walk, and take transit. David Margulis, a member and downtown merchant. Uh, the police horse patrol is, has been important to merchants and visitors downtown since their inception. And they've helped us a lot in managing the road warriors. We've already invested in the barns and the facilities. And 
I think they'd be a, an important component in the downtown retail strategy. Chief Sizer has cut the Portland Mounted Patrol from the budget, and would you support putting the Horse Patrol back in the budget, and if not, why not? Boy, there are few third rails in local politics than the Police Mounted Patrol. Um, and I guess I need to correct the record on behalf of Rosie Sizer. She has to come up with budget cuts, like every bureau in the city has to come up with budget cuts. She's offered that up as a potential cut. It'll be up to the city council, uh, considering my proposed budget, whether or not it indeed will be cut. And it's far too early in the process to make promises on anything that's going to be offered up. There are going to be a number of programs and services that move forward in the budget from the bureaus on how to balance their budget. We have to balance our budget. City Council and, and myself, we've got um, the absolute difficult task of making trade-offs. I'm not saying one way or another on the amount of patrol or anything else in the budget at this point. I want to hear from you and you'll be invited to the public hearings and for what you care about most, come out and testify for it. I appreciate hearing from you. Ted Kay, City Club Mayor. Mr. Mayor, last year after you appeared here, City Club was roundly criticized for not asking you the hard question. I will do so now. During your campaign for mayor, you countered allegations about your conduct with a teenager saying, I have been the target of a nasty smear by a would-be political opponent. After the election, you said, I want to apologize to my colleagues for my dishonesty and especially to the people of Portland for my dishonesty. I should have been truthful from the beginning. My question, now that the people of Portland have the facts not available to them during the election, isn't it appropriate for you to support the recall campaign, in effect have another election now, and let the people either decide not to have you serve as mayor or provide you with a clear mandate to lead? Well, I appreciate the question. It's one that I've answered, you know, for uh, over a year. And I think Portlanders are fair-minded people, and I leave it to them as I have left it to them. Um, my uh, apologies were sincere, and I've let nothing with the help of a lot of people and a, a very committed city council to the, the problems and opportunities that we face as a city. Um, I've let nothing uh, distract me from my focus um, on increasing the graduation rate, increasing the number of family wage jobs, and making the city more sustainable. I want to take this opportunity, though, to also thank um, a great staff in the mayor's office. I think um, a policy staff second to none, and I would ask them all to stand. Uh, Tom Miller, my chief of staff, Warren Jimenez, my deputy, and the rest of you, please stand and thank them for their great job. Uh, Sam, I want to ask you about um, confrontations between mentally ill people and the police. Um, we still haven't heard the outcome of the Chassis investigation. We have another one going on right now <clears throat> about a recent uh, killing and uh, a proposal um, by, uh, to have the uh, uh, grand jury investigation information made public. So I'd like your views about what can be done about these encounters as well as anything about prevention. Well, on the prevention side, um, our partners at Multnomah County, led by Ted Wheeler, uh, we have been funding, we have been using city resources to uh, increase their programming or prevent deeper cuts in their programming. They've had a tough job um, in very rapidly declining resources, and it shows up on our streets. And uh, it's always surprising to me sometimes the disconnect. You cut and you cut and you cut the social safety nets that we all rely on. Many through the county, we've tried to protect, protect them as much as we can in the city and spend city money on county programs, but it's gonna show up in the streets. Um, Ted Wheeler and I and the city council are working on a, a mental health receiving center 
Uh, we've made funding commitments on that, so that's one thing. Second thing, I support the uh, auditor's independent review of the police uh, investigation of the chassis incident. I, I, the tragedy, I think it's important that um, that outside review occur of the police bureau's investigation and that we learn from it. Commissioner Leonard and Commissioner Saltzman are working on a follow-up to our work session on independent police review and they'll be coming forward with their ideas. They've consulted with me. I think they're doing good stuff. And the grand uh, publicizing the transcripts of grand jury proceedings when um, there is a law enforcement officer involved, a use of lethal force and a force and a, and a death, I actually testified in 2007 um, in front of uh, a committee uh, on a bill sponsored by State Senator Abel Gordley that would have mandated that statewide. I believe that's the right thing to do and I support Dan Saltzman's uh, efforts on that regard. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Sonia Montalbano, and I will confess to being a brand spanking new City Club member when I found out you had to be a member to ask a question, although I had been meaning to join for a long time. <laughs> so this is a, a two-part question. Uh, the first is personal. Um, those are beautiful, beautiful renderings of what could happen um, on Foster Road, being, I suspect, one of the few people in this room who actually live in that neighborhood. I would like to know when. When is that going to happen? Because I've seen many, many renderings of what will happen on Foster Road. Um, and then I see people wanting to put a stadium there and attention going other directions. The second question I have is, what is Portland, the city, doing in a concrete way to distinguish itself from other cities such as uh, uh, the ones that you mentioned earlier that wanted to become a hub of sustainability in the sense of attracting larger sustainable businesses to come to Portland. Thank you. You bet. Um, if there are, it, it, it wasn't, uh, so first the streetcar. It wasn't until we did the citywide streetcar plan uh, this year that went to city council that you actually began to see lines on the map and renderings of streetcars outside of the central city. So that's new. And today, by illustrating what if, um, I'm furthering that discussion. Uh, we've had initial discussions with, uh, with uh, citizen leadership in the Lintz area and, and the neighborhoods that are on the East Portland, and there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of enthusiasm that wasn't necessarily there before for a variety of reasons, in part because we weren't willing necessarily to be a a, a willing partner on our side, but I think that's changed. Those two dynamics have changed. So I'm, you know, these things take years to happen, but the planning, I hope, for the outside of this downtown central city streetcar, I hope we will have that planning underway in the coming months. In terms of how do we distinguish ourselves, you know, uh, everybody, every city, a list is a lot longer than the cities I mentioned. Uh, want to be, claim to be the, the clean technology sustainable hub of uh, the continent, the world, what have you. Some of them can make that claim with, I think, validity. A lot of them have made huge progress. You know, started here, we're here, made huge progress. And we need to keep a keen eye on the competition. But we're the city that has thought, planned, stare down the naysayers on sustainability, had great leadership from the state level and the regional level to help us. So we're the city that doesn't just think it and say it. We've actually done it more than these other cities. And that's our strength and that's why we gotta keep that strength going by being that laboratory of urban innovation. That's our strength. Mayor Mike Burton, a City Club member, I applaud your efforts to get us out of cars, use mass transit sort of thing, but we're still a port. We still are a major transportation center with the I-5, I-84 corridors coming right here, our shipping, rail. What's being done to address the continuous movement of that freight and to address the question of trying to make that kind of movement uh, perhaps more sustainable? 
When I talked about the need to, uh, you know, that, that every proactive strategy that we have, we'll take, you know, we're interested in any business that is, you know, interested in being good to their community in which they reside, you know, you know, treat their, their workers well, you know, limit their footprint. We're, we're open to any, the welcome mat's open to any business. Our proactive efforts, though, um, are both for neighborhood businesses, neighborhood business districts, like sidewalks are needed in a lot. But you're right, the traded sector is so key to bring wealth into the community. And we have a targeted industry strategy to help. It's a, it's a strong port, uh, partnership with the port. Um, transportation is key, so it's when I was transportation commissioner, uh, I finished the work started by then uh, transportation commissioner Jim Francisconi so that the city would have the first ever freight master plan that among other things, you know, says where do we channel freight within the city and what neighborhoods do we keep it out of and how do we be the fastest expediter of freight and, and the most cost effective because we're not the biggest. What is our competitive advantage globally? It's really, really important. It's a key part of, you know, my work representing the city on the Columbia River crossing. You know, the most valuable trip across the current and new bridge is the traded sector freight trip. And after that, it's the trip in which, um, a passenger trip where they have no other realistic choices by transit. So it's absolutely key. We're very lucky we've got this great Port of Portland that is, you know, really smart, really efficient. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it very much. Join us on February 12th for the State of the County with Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler. And as we close one more time, please join us in thanking Mayor Sam Adams, and we are adjourned. <laughs>